So we're back again with another Top 100. This time it's Sega Swan Song, the Dreamcast. So as anyone familiar with the website knows, we generally follow a bunch of guidelines for these lists. Unfortunately though, given the Dreamcast's short lifespan, we have to bend the rules a bit. So unlike usual, this list will include technically unimpressive ports from earlier systems, otherwise some genres would have just been completely absent. The games will however still have to reach a certain threshold. They'll have to have had more than a lazy resolution upgrade to be eligible. As usual, only official releases for the system are allowed too. But given that the Dreamcast has such a vibrant aftermarket library, I think I'll actually do a separate top 20 for unlicensed games at some point in the future. Anyway, that's enough waffling, on to the list. Only just making the cut at 100 we have UEFA Dream Soccer. Lamentably there weren't many good football games on the Dreamcast. Electronic Arts snubbed the system, and unfathomably Konami didn't create any games in their Pro Evolution Soccer series for it either, even though they probably would have cleaned up. As it is, this one is pretty respectable though. Creators Silicon Dreams kept tinkering and improving on the series with every release, and their work does pay off here. This was an exclusive game made for the Dreamcast in Midway's Thunder series of races. Gameplay in the series revolves around you boosting by picking up capsules littered throughout the levels, with the games also having a lot of emphasis on learning the best routes and shortcuts. In this one you're driving monster trucks over a range of indoor and outdoor environments. It's a solid, though challenging racer with a good number of tracks and options. Silver is a somewhat solid action RPG that has you searching the globe for magical orbs that are necessary to triumph over evil and rescue your kidnapped wife. The game must be one of the few British made action RPGs out there I think, coming from effectively the last remnants of Ocean Software. The story here isn't that inspired, but luckily the dialogue between characters is actually quite well done, and fortunately one of Ocean's standout composers did the music too, Dean Evans, who had produced some of the Super Nintendo's best ever soundtracks. Uh, for largely terrible games, but that wasn't his fault. The music is a real standout feature of the game, helping to give the title a lot of atmosphere and mood. The gameplay here is fairly simple, but reasonable. It would have strongly benefited from a co-op mode, so it's a shame there isn't one. So here we have a tricky platform game similar in style to the Crash Bandicoot games. You run and jump through the long, winding 3D stages, ride animals, and do the occasional 2D platforming section too. The main thing which sets this game apart is its magnetism mechanic. In the game you can swap between two different colours. If you're the same colour as an object it attracts you, uh, for rope swings for example, while if you're the opposite colour it will repel you, allowing you to bounce around the stages. You need to change on the fly, and changing to the wrong colour usually results in death. It's a fun game if you can get your head around it, but the learning curve is frankly too high. The game also has a cool, more puzzle orientated mode and I'd recommend starting there to learn the ropes first. This strategic team based shooter based on the uber popular Japanese license has you giving orders to a team of mechs whilst you attempt to complete a range of mission objectives. Overall a polished game with good presentation and lots of blasting action, but it is a little on the short side. So this was a comprehensive European exclusive Formula 1 racing game that has all of the stuff you'd expect from the genre such as various weather conditions, a good pit crew, and well done physics and handling uh, for the time. And it's all held together with some nice detailed graphics too. Whilst this game shares the name with the N64 game from the same publisher, bear in mind that it's really a new updated game in the series for the new season from a different team. Silent Scope is a port of a popular Konami light gun arcade game where you play as a special forces sniper attempting to take out a group of terrorists who have hostages. Unfortunately, because of the atypical way that the game worked, there were a lot of difficulties translating it to home consoles. You see, while I called it a light gun game earlier, it actually, strictly speaking, was not. The arcade gun was attached to a base that constantly registered the direction it was being pointed at at all times, whereas light guns tend to only register the direction the gun is pointing at when the trigger is pulled. Regardless, light gun support was not an option at the time, hence the game was ported with analog joystick control instead. Thankfully however, unbeknownst to me until recently, it also has undocumented mouse support, which is a godsend, and makes the gameplay much smoother and more in line with its fun arcade parent. This is a good version of the 4 player remote controlled racer from the PC. Revolt plays kind of like a kart racer, with you picking up a selection of weapons to sabotage your opponents with as you race through the oversized environments, but it's a little more technical in regards to the weight and feel of the cars. Choosing the correct car for the correct surface type can be the difference between winning and losing. Unfortunately, this does decrease its pick up and play value, an important factor for party games. Regardless, it's a fun game with quite a bit to do and see, 
There's a pretty good track editor and a stunt mode where you collect stars too. Avoid the PS1 and N64 versions though, those systems really struggle to run the game properly. This was an enhanced port of Treasure's Japan only N64 shooter. The Dreamcast version has much better backgrounds and less slowdown than the N64 game, as well as having some additional gameplay tweaks. And being that this version was released everywhere, it's also translated into English. The translation is kind of nonsensical for the most part. Fans of English will probably love it though. One of the lesser known Capcom fighters, but don't let that dissuade you. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is a 2D fighter based on the popular manga of the same name. Other than the usual fighting game fare, the main gameplay mechanic here revolves around the stand button. This button usually calls forth an avatar of the player and changes their stance and moveset. Like all of Capcom's fighters, the game is well constructed and has excellent art design and graphics. The stand gorge also manages to add a little uniqueness to the gameplay. This cinematic survival horror game garnered mixed reviews at the time, but in retrospect is one of the more memorable titles of the era including some fairly shocking content that was censored in the western release. The game has you playing as Laura, whose plane has crashed in the Canadian wilderness. She and the other survivors find themselves in a place that's infested with strange plant-like monsters that imitate humans. Laura sets out to discover what's going on. The gameplay is quite varied, with both first and third person exploration sections, random battles where you gain experience points, and lots of simplistic puzzles to solve. It's a flawed game, and not all that long either, but it's definitely an interesting title to check out. Cosmic Smash is an import only arcade port that plays kind of like a tennis game mixed with Breakout. You hit the ball back and forth trying to destroy blocks. Sometimes the blocks move and sometimes they are obstructed by indestructible blocks. Each stage has a time limit and when the time runs out it's game over. The game is quite bare bones as an arcade port, but it's fun, accessible and has a lot of style and replayability. This puzzle game from Namco has you drilling through the ground being careful not to get crushed by falling rocks. The main element of the gameplay here is not just to survive, but to work out the best way to collect all of the air as you make your way down, maximising points. And it's this element that adds longevity to the game. The Dreamcast port is closer to the original arcade in resolution, and has slightly higher colour than the PS1 game, but unfortunately that's about it for the extras. A bullet hell shooter from Capcom, Mars Matrix covers the screen with almost ornate patterns of bullets for you to navigate through. The game gives you a normal shot as well as a shotgun short range blast and allows you to grab the enemy bullets and throw them back. The longer you hold the bullets for, the longer the time for the next charge up will take, so it's worth grabbing and throwing them quickly. As usual, Capcom have provided a fun and well crafted game. This is a tactical first person shooter where you need to come up with a plan and then direct a whole squad through the various missions. Unlike the first Rainbow Six on Dreamcast, this supports the much needed mouse and keyboard controls, creating a much more efficient and in-depth play experience for the system. The original Alone in the Dark was one of the most important releases in the survival horror genre, and one of the obvious main influences on Resident Evil, but unfortunately the series almost immediately lost its way, with each sequel actually boosting the weaker aspects of the series, drowning out its main strengths. New Nightmare, which was developed for the PlayStation and Dreamcast concurrently by different teams, isn't quite a return to form, but it was a step in the right direction and an entertaining outing. The game's setting is the usual spooky mansion filled with puzzles fare, but the game adds a flashlight into the mix, which is used to search for items and deal with some enemies and puzzles, which is a welcome addition. And it also continues the series' HP Lovecraft influence, as opposed to Resi's very different Lucio Fulci style feel. Due to being properly designed for the Dreamcast hardware, it also looks fantastic, with high resolution backgrounds and respectable polygon counts that blow the PlayStation version away. I just wish the game had strayed more from the formula set down by Resident Evil. I'm not going to be too hard on the designers given that Resident Evil took so much from Alone in the Dark to begin with, but it's still a bit disappointing to see. All in all though, it's a respectable outing, and this is the best version of the game by far. This one is a sequel slash remake of the earlier PS1 game Demolition Racer. No Exit is a racing game built around destruction. It's actually made by the same people that worked on the Destruction Derby series. Coming first here only gives you a points multiplier. It's the points themselves that you need to win each race and it's smashing cars and causing pileups that afford you said points. So essentially you hang back gaining points off your opponents until the last lap and then make a rush for first place. It's a fun idea that gives the game a nice level of originality and makes for some exhilarating races and action. This Dreamcast iteration of the long running puzzle series carries on the core gameplay we all know and love. This fourth game in the series does also try to add a few new elements to the mix, 
The main ones being pulleys for the puzzle levels, which kind of take into account weight distribution. It was ported fairly late to the Dreamcast, arriving over a year after the PlayStation version of the game, but it's closer to the original arcade game in graphics, and they did add a collection of pretty good new puzzles to this version too. One of the later releases for the system, arriving in 2004, Castle of Shikigami 2 is an excellent vertically scrolling shooter and a must for fans of the genre. Here the main gameplay mechanic involves purposely cutting it close when evading the bullets, attempting to only just skim past them at every opportunity, as when you're close to touching a bullet your firepower is hugely increased and you can gain points much faster. It's an impressive game with nice aesthetics and a lot of replayability when striving for that high score placing. Machinex is an underappreciated first person adventure from the Atlas team most known for creating the Shin Megami Tensei series, uh, and it shows. During the course of the game you can choose to take control of different characters, each of which have different strengths and weaknesses, and each of which leads you down different branching paths. Unfortunately, the localization team made rather a mess of the game for its western release. It's both poorly translated and poorly dubbed, and has a lot of censorship, and it's even been made much harder too with the localizers removing a bunch of health packs and adding health penalties for using certain moves too. The US version definitely loses something in a transition, but it's still worth checking out. Now I'm going to start this off with a disclaimer. Illbleed is the lowest rated game I've ever had in any of my lists. It's a blatantly flawed game, however there's just something about its quirky, offbeat nature and general weirdness that I just love. Illbleed has all the usual aspects you'd expect of the survival horror genre. Puzzle solving, item management, combat, but it tries to do its own thing in other areas which results in a really memorable experience. The game is set in an evil theme park that's broken up into levels, with each level being a pastiche of a horror film staple. Crazed killers out for revenge, evil dolls, mannequins, tremors-esque worms, it's all here. In most levels is hidden something called a horror monitor. This device warns you of danger spots and can be used to mark them down, thereby rendering them harmless. Where the title shines is in its offbeat nature, whether you're trying to help an evil cake find the perfect topping, or shooting at a ring-dropping demon version of Sonic the Hedgehog, there's never a dull moment. Illbleed is not for everyone, there's certainly the odd misstep with the gameplay and a lot of dodgy execution here and there, but personally I find it a flawed gem. Now this one pleasantly surprised me. It's from Argonaut, the company who designed the Super FX chip for the Super Nintendo and helped to make the original Star Fox. Red Dog is a science fiction themed action game where you control a futuristic tank. The game gives you a machine gun shot as well as rockets, uh, which work in a similar manner to rail shooters, with you sweeping the cursor across a set of enemies to target lock them and dispatch them in sets. The interesting element of the gameplay here though is a reflective shield. If you can bring it up in time it will reflect enemy shots back to their source, and mastering this move is crucial to progressing. Some good graphics, nice boss fights and an excellent multiplayer also help to make it worth checking out. This was a very fun boxing game at the time that didn't take itself too seriously, actually including Michael Jackson and Shaquille O'Neal as playable characters. The original was quite popular during the early days of Dreamcast, with many kiosks in shops including a playable demo of the game, but at heart it was really a previous gen game that didn't fully utilise the system's capabilities. This sequel however was much more geared towards the Dreamcast and PS2 consoles from the get go, with the N64 and PS1 really struggling to run the game. Outside of the graphical improvements though, there's also some work that's been done on the balance and AI, making it a very slightly more technical game than before. This is a strategy game that has you running a railroad business. I guess you could compare it to games like Theme Park and SimCity and such. The game has you playing through historical scenarios building up a railway system and deciding on what freight or passengers to transport, whilst adapting to situations like train robberies and economic downturns. This isn't the sort of game that is all that common on Dreamcast, so it's fortunate that this is actually a pretty good one, even including mouse support. This Dreamcast version is also actually not just a port of the original PC game, but is a complete remake with new 3D graphics. Whilst the first of the NHL 2K games on the Dreamcast was solid, it didn't quite live up to its other, more renowned siblings in quality. This however changed with the 2002 edition, which represented a huge improvement for the series. The AI here has been improved, the controls are deeper, and the graphics have also had another layer of polish applied. It's a smooth and responsive take on the sport, with a slight simish feel, and it's a great game for any ice hockey fan. This is a very respectable kart racer for the time, in the vein of the ever popular Mario Kart series, which uses the very apt Wacky Races cartoon license. It was actually made by many of the same people who later worked on the excellent Sega All-Stars Racing series. 
Thankfully, much like their later work, Wacky Races does try to do some of its own thing and deviates from Mario Kart enough to make it somewhat notable in its own right. Here, at the start of each race you get to allocate three different moves to your kart and these moves are powered by coins collected en route. This setup lends a different strategy to the game as some courses may have shortcuts made easier by choosing the flight ability for instance, whilst others may benefit more from boosting. It's actually a reasonable game with a comprehensive single player mode with lots of content, and it was one of the most impressively programmed games on Dreamcast 2, having one of the highest polygon counts on the system, as well as being one of the few games that used the Dreamcast hardware's super sampling anti-aliasing feature. Cannon Spike is a no-nonsense two-player top-down shooter from Psycho and Capcom that stars a variety of their characters, such as Mega Man, Kami, Arthur from Ghosts and Goblins, etc. etc. You get 360 degree firing with a target lock, a screen clearing move to get out of dangerous situations, melee moves and a powered up attack. For the most part it's simply about action packed bullet dodging and destroying bosses. A polished and fun arcade game. This was a futuristic racer from Atari and Midway ported from their popular coin op. Midway did a very good job with the Dreamcast conversion. It looks great, even better than the arcade original and also contains a lot of modes and extras, including stunt modes and an excellent 4 player battle mode too. The game later appeared on the other consoles of the generation in Midway Arcade Treasures 3, but they kind of made a mess of the port. This very uh, oddly titled game is, thankfully, not some kind of freaky robo fetish dating sim, it's actually a 3D fighter from genre stalwarts Capcom, and it's one of their more underappreciated titles. Tech Romancer has you playing as a variety of Gundam style mechs, each with their own selection of weapons and moves. On top of the usual staples, you can pick up and use items found on the ground that have defensive and offensive applications, as well as having access to a finishing move which can outright kill an opponent who's on low health. Definitely worth checking out for fans of both fighters and big destructive mechs. This was an outstanding and graphically impressive basketball game from Sega and Visual Concepts which admirably lives up to the high pedigree of the rest of their 2K series of sports games. And unlike some other companies known for their sports titles, who just endlessly rehash the same game over and over just updating the character roster each year, Visual Concepts actually added a bunch of improvements here over the previous games on the system. A smart basketball game with excellent controls and a great online multiplayer that really rewarded players who attempted to plan out a proper strategy. In the absence of a proper release of Half-Life, uh, near finished copies can be downloaded but the game was never officially released. I'd say this provides the best FPS campaign on Dreamcast. Soldier of Fortune is a no nonsense shooter that was known at the time for its attempt at doing area specific gore. It's an action packed game with you rushing through the levels dealing death and destruction. The game probably isn't going to blow you away and the load times can be a bit excessive at times but it looks reasonable and plays well. And like all the best FPS games on Dreamcast it benefits a lot from having mouse and keyboard support too. This is a cool 4 player top down shooter RPG hybrid that has you blasting aliens and exploring a galaxy of planets in deep space whilst levelling up and buying better equipment. You start off on your home planet and it's here that you pick up mission objectives and plot points during the course of the game. It's a unique game and the split screen multiplayer is a ton of fun. Hydro Thunder is a powerboat racing game in the vein of Wave Race and the like that was actually a launch title for the Dreamcast. Like 4 Wheel Thunder the game is part of the Thunder series of racers where you collect capsules which give you an energy boost for a short period of time. Hydro Thunder actually looks pretty nice for an earlier title, with reasonable water effects and graphics. Later on the game actually gained some downgraded ports to the previous generation consoles, but obviously these versions ended up being much more compromised. A fun game with lots of longevity and shortcuts to discover. So this 2D action adventure game is in the vein of earlier 2D Zelda titles, except with fully 3D boss fights. In the game you play as a stranger who was found long ago in suspended animation inside a strange mech suit. After a long period of sleep you suddenly wake up with total amnesia. As mentioned earlier the game plays like earlier Zelda games. You explore, find health upgrades and new equipment and gain new abilities to progress. You get a punch move as well as a very useful spin attack which uses up energy. It's a well made game that's a good example of its type during a time when the subgenre was becoming quite rare. So this one is a nice import only rhythm action game from SNK where you hold the analog stick in specific directions whilst pressing buttons in rhythm to the music. It's a good game with a lot of catchy tunes and nice aesthetics and backgrounds and is also one of the few titles to also support Samba de Amigo's Maraca controller though it's still a lot of fun with or without it. A likeable game all in all. Sega GT was Sega's big attempt at a Gran Turismo competitor 
It's certainly no Gran Turismo, but I'd say it's a somewhat successful endeavour in the genre regardless. The game gives you a lot of cars, good handling and a plethora of options. It's a very respectable release and doesn't look too shabby either. An excellent fishing game ported from Sega's arcade original that uses a Dreamcast dedicated fishing controller for extra authenticity. It might not sound impressive on paper, but in practice it's some good, addictive and relaxing fun. This was an accessible and stylish 2D fighting game from Arc System Works that has some awesome graphics and art design. Guilty Gear X is a likeable, very combo heavy fighter that's easy to pick up and play but isn't too shallow either. The Dreamcast version is pretty much arcade perfect. This is a pretty good hack and slash Diablo style RPG that is just one of many games based on a popular series of books slash anime released in Japan, with this being one of the only ones to get a western release. Whilst the story unfolds you essentially run through the dungeons hacking at the hordes of monsters and recruiting AI controlled party members to help. The deeper part of the gameplay involves searching out and collecting runes. These runes can be combined with the equipment for various effects and stat boosts. It's an interesting Japanese take on a more western style type of RPG. Trigger Heart Exelica is another polish shim up for Dreamcast that has some nice art design and graphics. The main gameplay hook here is, well, a hook that players can fire off to grab enemy ships at which point they can be used as shields or thrown off to inflict destruction on their allies. This Dreamcast version also adds a few extras, including a new arrange mode. This is an update of the unique N64 puzzle game, with a new scale and resolution and some pretty cool new background effects too. The game is quite difficult to explain, but simply put the aim is to create as many small duck lakes as possible while trying to stop the water from leaking off of the edges. The easiest way to create one of these small lakes is to dump two of the square Wetrix pieces on top of each other and fill them with water. I have to say I really like this game, it's actually one of my favourite puzzle games of all time, but unfortunately it has one pretty glaring problem. It has one of the steepest difficulty curves of any puzzle game out there. Just getting to the stage where you can precisely place the pieces takes a lot of practice, let alone getting to grips with all of the finer points of the gameplay and tactics. Still, when you get past that initial hurdle it's very addictive stuff. Confidential Mission is a pretty cool light gun shooter with a very James Bond-esque theme. It's also reminiscent of Sega's earlier Virtua Cop games. It's a balanced title, it looks pretty good and it throws in enough other elements, such as objectives which lead to branching paths, to make it stand out as one of the better light gun games of the time. On top of the main mode you get a lot of extra content here too, including a bunch of nice mini games and variants to try. Outrigger is a first person shooter from Sega that's similar to the deathmatch style FPS games like Quake 3 and Unreal Tournament, but with more of an arcade feel. The game doesn't really focus on weaponry much, and is mainly about straightforward multiplayer action, power ups and collecting coins. Essentially, in the game you get a point for each kill, but another can be gained by picking up a coin that's dropped after the kill. The cramped, layered design of the levels facilitates a lot of last minute coin steals from other players, thereby lending the game a slightly different feel to the other first person shooters out there. Our trigger looks good, plays well in 4 player and runs very well, with the frame rate staying consistent throughout. The default control is a bit odd, but there are many different control options available, with option D1 representing the standard Dreamcast first person shooter controls. A popular block falling puzzle game with a Capcom fighting game theme. Here you need to match the blocks up with the corresponding trigger to clear them, and as usual setting up combos hurts your opponents even more. This is much like the game on Saturn and PS1, but with better resolution and some nice additional modes that mix things up a bit. The main reason for its existence however, was the new inclusion of an excellent online multiplayer, a feature that's unfortunately no longer functional, though that may change in the future. Another fun Dreamcast puzzle game with a lot of charm. One of the best King of Fighters games, and a huge improvement over the previous year's effort. King of Fighters 2002 gives you a huge character roster of old and new favourites from the history of the series, and returns to the classic gameplay of old, ditching the striker system and replacing it with some new desperation moves. The Dreamcast version of the game is an all around good port that does the game justice. The second major release in the Grand Theft Auto series provided various improvements to graphics and gameplay, whilst keeping the basic structure of the popular original intact. In the game, you drive through the streets in top-down view completing missions whilst avoiding cops and gaining respect from the local gangs. In comparison to later games in the series, these earlier releases feel very different. At this stage it's all a lot more straightforward, arcadey and action focused, with a lot more of a pick up and play feel. The Dreamcast version is closer to the original PC game in visuals and represents a big improvement over the PS1 port in regards to frame rate, lighting and effects, but the controls are a little weaker due to a lack of buttons. 
This turn-based strategy game from the popular Worm series was made specially for the Dreamcast after Sega had asked the developer, Team17, to make something to strengthen the Dreamcast's burgeoning online library. As the first Worms game on the system, Armageddon had lacked online multiplayer when ported to Dreamcast. Team17 effectively just made an update of their earlier classic game, which was actually arguably the best game in the series, just now with the crucial online component and a handful of extras. Then, unfathomably, they actually ported it back to the other consoles without its online component. Anyway, the series has you controlling a team of worms who need to wipe out the competition using a variety of wacky weapons. And on top of always having a metric ton of charm, the series is without doubt a classic of multiplayer gaming. Online really suited the game perfectly, and while it went offline for many years it's recently been brought back into functioning order, though it's admittedly a lot more complicated to get up and running now than back in the day. This is from an acclaimed series of American football games that were introduced on the Dreamcast to high praise in 1999. At the time, NFL 2K games represented the leading video game series for the sport, with great gameplay, graphics and impressive, uh, for the time, AI. The game is full of excellent options, including a lot for player customization, and the Dreamcast version also has one of the more notable implementations of the Dreamcast VMU screen available, allowing the little screen to be used for play calling, so essentially you can choose tactics without your opponent knowing. A nice touch. Mark of the Wolves is a beautiful 2D fighter from SNK that is often considered to be amongst the greatest fighting games they've ever produced. The game looks fantastic and plays well, dumping the plane switching mechanic of its forebears and putting more focus on feint moves as well as a just defend move that is similar to the parry move in Street Fighter 3. If you push back at the exact moment of contact here you do a block which gains you a little health. Perhaps bear in mind that many years after this port, more accurate versions were released, and some versions of the game have issues with sound lag on some Dreamcasts. This was a criminally overlooked, no-nonsense Bomberman game, with surprisingly high production values and lovely presentation. In these games you have to place bombs to blow up your opponents, whilst being careful not to die yourself. A perfect and timeless concept for multiplayer shenanigans. Bomberman Online focuses completely on this multiplayer element. There's no half assed attempt at a campaign mode here, just a big tournament of rounds with boss fights, much like the 16-bit games. Thankfully the designers didn't completely rest on their laurels though. There's loads of new modes here, each of which put a new spin on the classic gameplay and complement the range of older maps well. The game is no longer online unfortunately, but there's currently a concerted effort to remedy this, and there's been a lot of success recently with other games in a similar position. Either way, the game still plays fantastically offline anyway. Shadow Man is a creepy action-adventure game based on a 90s comic book from Valiant, which was a company that publisher Acclaim had bought in 1994, and the same company that also made the Turok comics of the time, leading Acclaim to convert some of their properties to video games. It's an atmospheric game with good puzzles and a memorable setting, and this Dreamcast port was the best console version of the game available at the time, better than the respectable N64 version, which has worse sound and frame rate, and leagues ahead of the terrible, rushed PS1 version. This was a pretty nice space combat simulator from the people who made the acclaimed Wing Commander series. Here you fly around following and giving orders, taking part in dogfights and or protecting defenseless ships from attack. The storyline changes as you progress and there's many branching pathways to see based on how well you do. The controls here are admittedly complex, but work with practice and make for some exciting dogfights. Star Lancer also has an online multiplayer component which plays well and is actually one of the titles which still works online today, even after all of these years. Another excellent shoot 'em up from the arcades flawlessly ported to Dreamcast. Zero Gunner is an action packed shooter that gives you full 360 degree rotation to deal with enemies that rush you from all directions. Great bosses, great graphics and whilst hard at first the 360 degree movement works flawlessly with practice and is a very fun gameplay mechanic. Another nice game for shooter fans to add to their collection. MDK2 is a third person shooter and sequel to developer Shiny's popular earlier PC title. This time it's Bioware doing the development duties, and thankfully they don't disappoint. It's a tough game with a lot of Twitch gameplay that's aimed at hardcore shooter fans, so expect to do levels multiple times before you get them right. A later PS2 version arrived with an easier difficulty curve, but had inferior graphics in regards to resolution, lighting and filtering. Project Justice is Capcom's manic and colourful sequel to their earlier arcade 3D fighting game Rival Schools, which had been successfully ported to the PS1. The game plays a little like their Versus series, but in 3D, with you able to pull off aerial raves and call in backup during the match from your two teammates in reserve. 
It's an underrated, accessible and fun over-the-top game that as far as I know was never ported to any other consoles either. Sequel to Sega's beloved arcade racing game that adds a lot more tracks, options and modes. Sega Rally 2 is very much an arcade game at heart, so don't expect an ultra-realistic experience here. The game is all about sliding around corners at high speed and racing against the clock. The port to Dreamcast is respectable but visually disappointing. It's an early release and it shows. I actually disregarded this port for quite some time because online it's been always sort of seen as somewhat disappointing, but I actually had a lot of fun with this. This was a very polished vertical scrolling shooter where you can direct your fire to the right and left and lock your aim in place by holding down the fire button. Other than the aiming system the game gives you a helper that you can release by pressing the fire button when a bar to the side of the screen fills, this helper comes in a range of different types and can be changed by picking up the relevant power up. The game has very nice graphics and a huge amount of attention to detail with very nice animation. Just watch the trees on the ground react to the explosions around them for instance. A very good Dreamcast shooter. Toy Commander is a quirky mission based game that has you controlling a huge variety of different toy vehicles, ranging from land based tanks and jeeps to airplanes, biplanes and helicopters, amongst many others. You control these toys around a house completing a variety of novel missions, such as dropping sugar into a cup or dealing with rampaging monsters in rabbit costumes and such. Other than the tricky single player mode, the game also has a very good four player split screen dogfight option that gives you full choice of all of the vehicles and a number of different modes that make it shine as a party game too. This was a very early Dreamcast 3D fighter from the popular series that was actually a launch title in Japan. Like earlier games in the series, Virtua Fighter 3 is an in-depth technical fighter that rewards practice and mastery. New additions here include sloping, uneven ground for the arenas, as well as the option of team battle mode. It's a good game, but does sometimes show its origins as an early title for the system in the graphics, and was very much completely overshadowed by Soul Calibur, never managing to attain the popularity of the renowned previous games in the series. So this one was a pseudo sequel slash enhanced remake of the classic Sega arcade racer that included graphically revamped versions of all of the courses from the previous games in the series plus three new ones and a new online multiplayer component for four player races. For those unfamiliar with the series, Daytona is a race with an emphasis on speed and over the top power slides uh, which are done by quickly changing gears. It's a bombastic game that requires a hell of a lot of practice to fully master but is very rewarding to learn and fun to play. This one was released to bolster Sega's online portfolio and did a fantastic job of it. The game is fun both online and offline and thankfully, after years of the online service being down, has recently come back this year in 2023. It's best experienced with the Dreamcast steering wheel peripheral, but it's fine with the Dreamcast pad once you've got the hang of it. This definitely has to be the best of the officially released horizontally scrolling shmups on Dreamcast and by no small margin. Each level here has three slightly different versions, or borders as they're called here, and every time you die you get booted down to a lower version of the level that's easier. Drop off the bottom border and the game is over. As standard you get given a rapid fire shot, uh, hold the button down, but also a slower homing shot if you press the button, and it's wise to swap between both moves regularly. Outside of that you get the usual power ups and some intense boss fights. This underrated little 4 player split screen title stands as easily one of the best party games available on the system. Ooga Booga has you collecting fruit to use for projectiles or as currency to buy automated guard towers. You get a melee attack and are also able to commandeer animals such as wild boars or birds to help you lay the smack down on your enemies. Outside of the main mode you get others as well such as the equally brilliant boar polo that has you knocking a boulder through the opponent's goal. The game has a very weak single player, but the multiplayer is great fun and the game is packed full of humour and charm. Happily its online multiplayer has also recently been brought back into working order too. After a long hiatus, Echo the Dolphin returned to gaming, and this time in full 3D. This is a challenging action adventure game where you swim through the ocean exploring, solving puzzles and helping sea creatures, whilst travelling back and forth through time and to alternate futures in an effort to deal with the foe. The game has beautiful, vibrant environments and is thick with atmosphere. It's tricky to get a handle on at first, but after some initial effort it grabs you in and you'll want to see and explore more of the environment. There's actually a PS2 port also available which was made easier and more straightforward. Those who tend to get lost in these types of games may be better off with that version to be honest, though image clarity may be better here. This was an excellent addition to the popular puzzle series. Poyo Poyo Fever represented a return to form for the games building on the classic gameplay by adding in some new elements such as the frenetic fever mode to increase the tension and keep the game fresh. 
Other than the gameplay changes, this goes for a new 2.5D look, with nice animation and some pleasant revolving background effects. Test Drive Le Mans is a precise, simish racer from Melbourne House that was designed for the ground up for Dreamcast, largely unrelated to the risible PS1 game made by another company. This was a title that was packed full of attention to detail, you can even do the full 24 hour race in real time, and was a well crafted game with some of the best graphics on the Dreamcast, with clean visuals and excellent reflection effects and filtering. Uh, reportedly it's actually the only game to use the Dreamcast's hardware anisotropic filtering. A later PS2 port was also made but had a few graphical downgrades, so if you have both systems go for the Dreamcast one. Power Stone is an excellent fighting game where players run around 3D environments, fighting and picking up and using weapons and throwing objects at each other while searching for the titular Power Stones. When three Power Stones are collected you're transformed into a more powerful form for a short period and given devastating new moves. So when I made the original written version of this list back in the day I actually left this game off entirely, which in retrospect seems like quite a bit of a dumb call, frankly. Essentially, with these lists I always tend to try to stay away from including too many similar releases from a single series, but this rule really wasn't relevant in this case because, to be honest, Power Stone 1 plays very little like its sequel anyway. Unlike its madcap party game sequel, this one tries to keep up more of a pretense of being a serious fighter. There's no wild moving arenas here, just carefully designed static stages, and there's other notable differences too. Here for example you can climb around the stages, a feature that was largely absent in the sequel. All in all, this was an excellent game in its own right, and was yet another fantastic Dreamcast title to pick up on launch day to show off the system. Sega coming out with yet another outlandish idea for a Dreamcast game. They really were willing to try pretty much anything at this stage. Here they have converted their well-loved light gun shooter, House of the Dead 2, into an entirely different game that makes full use of the keyboard peripheral. In the game, the usual zombies lumber towards you, but now they each have a sentence hovering above them. You need to type the sentence out before they reach you to dispatch the zombie. The concept actually makes for a very fun, intense and original experience, all whilst improving your typing ability. This is a feature rich 2D fighter from Capcom that has their main characters taking on those of rival fighting company SNK. The main gameplay inclusion here is the ability to choose from a large variety of grooves. You get different abilities depending on which groove you choose, so with one groove you may be allowed to block in mid-air for instance, but not parry whilst a different groove will give you custom combos or a different type of super. The game is one of the more impressive looking fighters on Dreamcast due to incorporating 3D backgrounds and is pretty much arcade perfect here due to the Dreamcast sharing hardware with the original arcade machine that the game was designed for. Out of the ports, the PS2 version is also very good, but less so the later GameCube and Xbox versions. Here's a reasonable port of the classic 3D platformer that had you playing as the popular French character Rayman as he jumped, grappled and climbed his way through the imaginative levels, solving puzzles and riding around on rockets. It's a port from the previous gen so don't expect too much out of the graphics, but the game was one of the greatest 3D platformers of its time and this Dreamcast version did have some improvements in regards to the texturing and frame rate, which is a rock solid 60fps here, which arguably makes it the best version of the game. Uh, there's definitely some trade-offs with the much later PS2 version though. This stands up as an excellent example of how to make a 3D sequel to a 2D game without losing the property's core personality. This is an enhanced port of the classic PlayStation skateboarding game. Essentially you have to ride around exploring the environments, completing different objectives and racking up points by doing a variety of tricks, pulled off with different button combinations. For this sequel, developers Treyarch also added a bunch of editing options, allowing you to customise your character and create your own park to practice in with the level editor. This version has improved graphics for the Dreamcast, with better quality texturing and slightly improved polygon counts and draw distance, but isn't exactly pushing the console, so I dropped it a few places. Make no mistake though, it's a phenomenal game that had a very unique and addictive concept at the time, and it remains a lot of fun. This was an excellent first person shooter classic ported from the PC and was yet another reason at the time to invest in the Dreamcast mouse and keyboard peripherals. The game is a very well balanced multiplayer deathmatch focused title and it's easy to see why it became so massive on PC. You get a lot of quirky weapons here, each with their own tricks and tactics, and a lot of well balanced stage layouts too. Uh, the Dreamcast port especially has stacks and stacks of maps here, far more than the PS2 version had. The online component of the game unfortunately no longer functions, but there's a good 4 player split screen mode available, and while some stages have lowish frame rates, there's so many stages that do run well that you're never sure of smooth levels to choose from. Space Channel 5 is a quirky rhythm action game where you try to keep in time with the on-screen prompts. 
In the game you play a space reporter, Ooh La La, whose style is sort of reminiscent of the singer from the 90s band D-Light, as she tries to save the station from aliens by taking part in a series of dance-offs. It's yet another unique and stylish game for the system to add to the stack. Certainly nobody could ever criticise the Dreamcast for having no style. Headhunter was a stealthy action-adventure game that was billed as Sega's answer to Metal Gear Solid, but came out just a little too late to make any difference to the Dreamcast's fate, only just managing to achieve a European release for the console. The game is pretty impressive for its time, with nice graphics and a big open world for you to travel around to get from mission to mission. The storyline is pretty good, with a lot of tongue-in-cheek satire and fake adverts, similar to the original Robocop movie for example. And there are many memorable set pieces too. A later PS2 port is also available which has some downgrades to lighting, texturing and the bike control, but it's a reasonable enough version of the game. This was a large and imaginative 3D platform shooter from Bizarre Creations, the people who made Project Gotham Racing and Geometry Wars. It's in the vein of Rareware's N64 titles, games like Conker's Bad Fur Day, Jet Force Gemini or Donkey Kong 64. It's just generally a smart, funny game with some charm that gives you lots to do and see. A later PS2 port is also available that had some added novelties, the most notable of which was voice acting, but there was some limited cell shading added as well. However, it was downgraded in pretty much all other areas, notably texturing, resolution, load times and draw distance, so I'd say it's probably best to stick to the Dreamcast original. Dash around the environment shooting off volleys of shots, taking cover and charging into hand-to-hand -hand melees with this colourful two-player mech combat versus game from Sega a sequel to their earlier arcade hit. It's a complex, action-packed game that's best played with the elaborate Twin Sticks controller it was designed for, but can be played reasonably well on a pad for far less money. The game supports split-screen and link-up between consoles. Another classic from the PS1 generation that's been improved for Dreamcast. Soul Reaver is an imaginative and moody action-adventure game, which has you playing as a recently reincarnated vampire, Raziel, trying to get revenge on those who've wronged him. The gameplay has you exploring the world gaining new abilities which allow you to access new areas. The combat is well done with a lot of fun elements. Uh, you can throw the vampires into direct sunlight or carry them and impale them on spikes for instance. It's full of well thought out puzzles and the storyline is interesting and well directed too. This version sports improved graphics over the PC game even, with slight improvements to texturing and polygon count. As such it's the best version of the classic game available. The game ended up doing pretty well on Dreamcast, and Soul Reaver 2 was actually in development and quite far along before being cancelled when the system died. Here's a nice challenging racing game from Sega which manages to aim for an admirable amount of realism while still retaining that classic Sega arcade game look and atmosphere. The game has fantastic graphics for the console and has an inordinate amount of attention to detail in regards to the titular car and the way it handles and moves. A later, slightly graphically downgraded version was also made available for the PS2 a couple of years later. It was a long time coming, but when Street Fighter 3 finally did turn up, it did it with style and panache. The main addition here over the earlier games is a system of parrying, which allows you to take no damage if you push forwards at the moment and attack connects, uh, as opposed to just blocking which still causes you some damage. The art design here is phenomenal, with the game being full of great backgrounds and very fitting music. The Dreamcast actually had all three of the major iterations of the game released on it, with the game known as Double Impact, including the first two versions, and Third Strike getting a standalone release. Third Strike is the more popular version, but Double Impact was exclusive to Dreamcast and had its own look and feel with unique stages, so it's also worth checking out. Final note though, the Dreamcast version of Third Strike is based on a later, less popular revision of the arcade machine that's rarely played in tournaments. So if you're looking to go out and play the game competitively, you honestly may be better off with one of the other ports. The all-time classic light gun game that continued to be a stalwart of arcade parlours for a decade. In House of the Dead 2, basically a town is overrun with zombies and it's your job to clean up the place. The gameplay is the usual light gun fare. The zombies lumber towards you while you desperately try to put them down with a headshot. Civilians with death wishes jump out in front of you at inopportune moments and spout mildly risque sounding English and the bosses are big and exciting to battle. Definitely one of the most important and popular light gun games out there, and the Dreamcast port has some nice extras too. While Sonic Adventure is probably one of the more dated games on the list, uh, hence placing just outside the top 20, this launch title remains a very fun, though occasionally troublesome experience full of hefty amounts of ideas and some very imaginative level designs. The game gives you a big overworld to explore, the platforming is dynamic and exciting, and there's even a variety of different characters to use. 
One thing that experience has taught me that I have to bring up here is bear in mind that this is a very old game. Don't let the graphics fool you. Not only did this game come out years before any of the big PS2 platformers, it actually came out years before a bunch of the popular PS1 platformers too. This is not a contemporary of games like Ratchet and Clank. It's a contemporary of the first Spyro the Dragon game and is only a couple of years after Mario 64. Cameras were still temperamental at the time. If anything, for its era the game was overambitious. The sheer scale and spectacle of it running back in 1998 cannot be understated, and when footage came out from Japan at the time it was mind-blowing. There was nothing quite like it out there with this level of speed and exuberance. Also note that the Dreamcast version is by far the best official version of the game as well, with each iteration of it adding more bugs, glitches and downgrades than the last. Samba de Amigo is a bright and fun rhythm action game with good music and visuals that oozes with likeability and charm. The game comes with some special maraca controllers, which you have to wave and shake about at specified points to the rhythm of the music. It was a memorably silly game with excellent art design. Avoid the later Wii version though, as the tech was seemingly not up to the task of accurately registering the player's movement and position. This was a fun and accessible arcade tennis game from Sega, with an emphasis on being pick up and play. The Virtua Tennis series are pretty much the most beloved series of retro tennis games out there, perfectly straddling the line between realism and fun, whilst providing a lot of options and longevity. The game is great to play with three friends as a party game, but even as a single player experience it's excellent, with a great tournament mode and tons of fun mini games. This was a fast paced 3D fighting game from Tecmo, with a system based around countering as its main hook. The game is fast, fluid, vibrant and uh, very well animated. It has the usual emphasis on combos and moves, but does it all very well and looks fantastic too, displaying some of the highest polygon counts on the console. Surprisingly, there were actually four different versions of the game released for Dreamcast, with the North American release being the most bare bones, and the Japanese limited edition version being the strongest with the most added content. The sequel to the classic Saturn and PlayStation RPG. Grandia 2 puts the game in full 3D and gives you a new cast of Geohounds, uh, essentially mercenaries, and priestesses to meet. The RPG has a unique and clever combat system that's turn-based, but has the characters moving about in real time by themselves, which leads to a focus on timing in addition to the usual RPG tactics. In comparison to the Dreamcast's other famous RPG, Skies of Arcadia, Grandia feels a little linear and straightforward, with Skies being the better game to explore, but I'd say Grandia is the one with the better battle system. The game was later ported to PS2, but avoid this version, Unfortunately, it was a very buggy rush job that doesn't do the game justice. Here is a very nice port of the Fast and Furious PC game, a first-person shooter classic. The game looks excellent, runs well, and has all the required features, such as mouse and keyboard support, a must if you want to play the game properly, as it's frankly just too fast for analog control. It has four-player split-screen support and even online deathmatch too, which happily, like Star Lancer, is actually still functioning. The game is a violent and intense first person shooter, completely targeted to deathmatch gaming. The arenas are well designed and the imaginative weapons are an absolute joy to use. Fantasy Star Online was an ambitious early attempt by Sega at creating an online console RPG. The gameplay revolves around forming a party of players to take on the various dungeons as a team, whilst gaining experience and discovering and buying new items. There's also a lot of optimization options here for the time, with a character editor tool as well as a decent number of different classes and races to choose from, each with different strengths and weaknesses. Unfortunately these days, while it's possible to play the game online, it's a bit of a pain as all the official servers have long since closed down, leaving you only unofficial options. The game can still be played offline, but without the social aspects it definitely loses something. So this was an utterly awesome and highly underrated 4 player fighting game sequel from Capcom. Everything from the original Power Stone is back, but now dialed up to 11, with tons of new items, weapons, modes and characters, as well as vehicles to temporarily commandeer too. The addition of 4 player support increases the insanity by orders of magnitude, and the game makes for an excellent party game, with its ever changing, evolving Smash Brothers esque stages making for some over the top action, with all the players struggling for that last necessary Power Stone leading to a load of tension and excitement. Definitely one of the best party games of its era. Getting the eagerly anticipated next-gen Resident Evil was a real coup for Sega at the time, with the game creating more than its fair share of hype for the system. Happily, it didn't disappoint. Code Veronica was the longest and most ambitious of the original Resident Evil survival horror games. It was a huge undertaking, with lots of emphasis on storyline and many areas to explore. 
Character plot lines from previous games were wrapped up, and fan favourite characters like Wesker also made their welcome return. The cinematics were impressive, and the game represented the series' first foray into true 3D backgrounds too, as opposed to the earlier pre-rendered 2D backgrounds. It's one of the more brutal games in the series, requiring very strict resource management at all times and punishing any mistakes with a merciless beating, with it almost feeling like it takes all of the Resident Evil mechanics and sort of takes them to their extreme. <laughs> but given that this was the final release that used the classic gameplay, at least aside from remakes, it's good in some ways that the more hardcore fans of the style were given one last meaty adventure to sink their teeth into. This frenetic 2D fighting game pits the most popular characters of the two companies against each other. Marvel vs Capcom 2 follows the basic mould of most Capcom fighters, such as Street Fighter, but is generally much more loose and over the top. The game pits two teams of three characters against each other, with the player being allowed to switch characters mid-fight, as well as call for aid. MVC fights are anarchic, with huge screen-filling tag team attacks, big combos and aerial raves. The amount of content here is very good, with lots to do and many characters to unlock. Many ports of the game exist, but the Dreamcast version is the best of its time because, like with Capcom vs SNK2, the game was from the same arcade machine that has almost identical hardware to the Dreamcast. This was a hugely ambitious game for its era. Shenmue reportedly had one of the largest development budgets of all time at release, and by no small margin either. The game is about Ryo Hazuki's search for his father's killer, and is essentially like a sandbox game, giving you full reign to explore your hometown at your leisure. Gameplay mainly revolves around information gathering, 3D fighting, completing mini-games and taking part in quick time events. The game is very cinematic and attempts to really immerse the player in its world, allowing you to work, buy trivial items or even hang out at the local arcades playing full versions of Sega classics like Space Harrier and Hang On. Out of the two Shenmue games on Dreamcast I decided to rate this one lower, but they are very different games with different strengths, the first Shenmue being more homely and personal in comparison to its louder and more bombastic sequel. This was an excellent sequel that was a lot more polished than its pioneering predecessor. Like the original Sonic Adventure, this has you playing with multiple characters, with the main campaign being split between three different game types, Sonic's high speed platform stages, Knuckles' exploration stages, and Tails' shooting and platforming levels. All three modes are fun, uh, though there are certainly some dud stages here and there, with Sonic's twisty, turning paths, gravity changes, set pieces and rail grinding creating a lot of exhilarating moments, and Knuckles' big, open, atmospheric levels being memorable to explore. Uh, Meteor Herd being the biggest standout here, but there's also the interesting Mario Galaxy reminiscent Mad Space too. The game is packed to the gills with content and has a lot of replay value. You're graded on your competence and given nice extras for full A ranks, and there's also a plethora of fun multiplayer options and even a virtual pet mode too, that has you raising, levelling up and experimenting with the game's cute chow creatures. A GameCube port of the game is also available, uh, there's some trade-offs here and there with the GameCube having higher polygon counts and more multiplayer maps, but it also had inferior lighting and more relentless handicapping in multiplayer, so mileage may vary. Metropolis Street Racer is a brilliant racing game that is pretty much the prequel to the highly rated Project Gotham Racing series. It's a fantastic looking game that has you racing around tracks based on London, Tokyo and San Francisco. But the big difference here is its incorporation of a system based around Kudos. Essentially you not only have to win races, but you have to win them with style, by taking risks, skidding around corners and avoiding collisions. Whilst very similar in structure to the later PGR titles, MSR still retains a personality of its own. It's a harder game for one, and its soundtrack from Sega stalwart Richard Jacks gives it a very different, bright and breezy atmosphere, whilst the later games were a little more geared towards realism. Other features, such as a real-time clock that changes the time of day in the game based on what the actual real world time is, were also welcome and novel ideas. This excellent shoot 'em up from Treasure has a very clever setup. Your ship can swap between two different colours at the press of a button. You can absorb enemy bullets of the matching colour, whilst the opposite colour will kill you. This leads to some nifty navigation and colour swapping to make it through the tougher sections of the game, and is a cool idea that breathes some new life into the genre. Outside of the gameplay mechanics we have the usual hallmarks of a great shooter. Lots of action, lots of dodging, lots of set pieces and memorable boss fights, all complemented with great art design that creates an epic feel. Yet another novel and well executed concept from Sega. Crazy Taxi has you playing a taxi driver trying to ferry passengers around a big city. As soon as you pick them up you're racing against the clock to get them to their destination as fast as possible and refill the timer. 
The game gives you a variety of different techniques to master, such as boosts and skids, and is very addictive. Like many Sega games, it just has that arcade pick up and play feel down to a T, and is great for quick gaming sessions. Out of the versions I'd say this was the best as well, with the GameCube coming a close second. So this definitely has to be one of the best and most elegantly designed puzzle games of its era, and during a generation where new, original puzzle releases would start to become a rarity no less. The key to a good puzzle game is in creating a simple and accessible concept with layers, and Choo Choo Rocket achieves this effortlessly. The game has you leading mice to your base by placing three arrows on the ground at a time, whilst making sure to lead cats away from your base, and preferably into your opponent's bases. Every now and then a rule change will occur that forces you to adapt to a new status quo. The four player here makes for an excellent party game, with friends vying for top place, rerouting each other's careful planning, and disposing of cats in each other's bases. But the single player has no shortage of entertaining brain teasers to solve too. The Dreamcast didn't have a hell of a lot of JRPGs during its short lifespan, but luckily this excellent steampunk RPG from Sega's Overworks team, uh, the makers of the Fantasy Star games, was a real standout in its day. Skies has you playing as a band of pirates who fly airships to and from floating islands. The game's battle system is respectable, giving you both on-foot battles and memorable large-scale ship-to-ship battles, but it's the exploration elements and excellent dungeon designs and clever puzzles that are the real success story. As usual, presentation and storyline are also top-notch, with likeable characters and well-done music. The game was later ported to GameCube with some improvements to gameplay, but much lower quality music and no VMU features. This is a very beloved, very stylish platform game where you form your own street gang of graffiti artists and then compete with rival gangs in tagging the city. At the beginning of each area you are given a map showing various target points, and the aim is to navigate the city attempting to reach these points to spray out some art, whilst avoiding police and keeping stocked up on spray cans. The game is a ton of fun, it's a unique experience and helped popularise cell shading with its superb art design and presentation, resulting in a short-lived explosion of games incorporating that style. Yet another Dreamcast game with beautiful art design, where you can really feel the love and attention to detail that the developers have heaped upon it. I'm not going to try to ramble on about synesthesia here, so I'll just say that this is a brilliantly artistic rail shooter that combines audio, video and tactile rumble elements to perfectly create an exciting, imaginative and unique experience that includes lots of memorable set pieces and creative artistic designs. Honestly, every true fan of gaming should try this game out at some point. After the groundbreaking original Shenmue, Sega came back with this, an even bigger and more ambitious game. Shenmue 2 drops the more laid-back hometown of the first game and throws you into a huge, bustling city full of crime and intrigue, with gangs and opportunistic individuals around every corner. The main gameplay here is similar to the original. It's an early sandbox title that's largely focused around exploration and information gathering, mini-games, 3D fighting and quick-time events, but it feels more focused and does a better job of pushing you in the direction you need to go than the original did, uh, which could be considered a good or bad thing depending on the player, I guess. Like its predecessor, the game really excelled over other games of the era, fully immersing the player in its world and characters, and giving them free reign to play the game and explore the city at their own pace, whether that be relentlessly fighting through the campaign, or loitering around at the local arcades or searching for collectibles and such. A memorable game with a timeless feel. And in number one we have Soul Calibur, one of the most stunning games of its time. Namco went the extra mile with this universally acclaimed arcade port from their Soul Blade fighting series, and it was actually a launch title for the Dreamcast to boot. The game has you fighting one-on-one -on -one with melee weapons in a 3D arena. Like all such games, you need to learn each character's specific combos and work out the best tactics and strategies to defeat your opponent. Not only did Namco actually improve the graphics here from the original arcade version, but they also packed it with content and extras. There's an astonishing amount of modes available, characters to unlock and things to do and see here that will keep you busy for weeks. Truly a genre-defining title for 3D fighting games. Well that's the end of the video, if you enjoyed it then please like and subscribe and maybe consider supporting us on Patreon, the link is in the description. See ya!